Good afternoon. We resume this afternoon with portfolio questions and we start with question number one from David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether the Ministerial Working Group on Fire Safety will review building standard regulations regarding the provision of automatic fire suppression systems. Thank you. I understand the Cabinet Secretary may wish to update the Parliament uh, following the Grenfell Fire disaster. Thank you, President Officer. The Ministerial Working Group on Building and Fire Safety was convened to oversee a review of building and fire safety regulatory frameworks and any other relevant matters in order to help ensure that people are safe in Scotland's buildings and make any recommendations for improvement as required. We met for the first time last week and will meet again this afternoon immediately following uh, parliamentary questions. The role automatic fire suppressant systems can play in supporting an overall package of fire safety measures for various building types will be discussed at this group. However, the member will understand that our initial priority has been to focus on providing assurance to the public about the safety of our domestic high-rise properties and other public buildings following the tragedy at Grenfell Tower. Building standards regulations for high-rise domestic properties in Scotland means aluminium composite material, the type of product used at Grenfell Tower, cannot be used in the cladding systems on high-rise domestic properties in Scotland. We wanted to double-check that this was the case and therefore we have sought and received assurances from all 32 of our local authorities. They have reported that ACM, the aluminium composite material, has not been used on any housing association or council-owned high-rise domestic properties. For privately owned high-rise domestic properties, 28 councils have reported that they have no aluminium composite material in the cladding systems. The other four councils are working intensively to complete the picture across Scotland. And I want to extend the Scottish Government's thanks to the Chief Executive and staff uh, and all of the local authorities for their assistance and diligent work in this process. David Stewart. <coughs> uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware from the Scottish Government's own 2015 report that almost a third of accidental dwelling fires and deaths occur in the 15% most deprived areas. Yet, there have been no multiple fire deaths in Scotland where a working sprinkler system has been installed. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet me after the recess to discuss targeted installation of sprinkler systems aimed at those most at risk, that is single men living in disadvantaged areas with alcohol or drug problems? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I would be delighted to meet uh, Mr Stewart um, either uh, during recess, if, uh, if that suited him. Um, I'm aware that Mr Stewart is a member of the Cross-Party Working Group on Accident Prevention, a group that's chaired uh, by Claire Adamson. Uh, I know that he has been a long-term campaigner and supporter uh, of uh, wider use of sprinklers. As I said in my original answer, the Ministerial Working Group will review all relevant matters, uh, including the role of uh, automatic fire suppressant systems. Um, while we know that our regulatory standards in Scotland are good, uh, nonetheless, we won't have any room for complacency and we're casting a critical eye uh, over all uh, our systems. Bob Doris. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will know that uh, the Local Government Communities Committee, which I chair, will be taking evidence in relation to building standards and fire regulations following the Grenfell Tower tragedy. The question, of course, was in relation to uh, sprinkler systems. I'm wondering if one of the things the Cabinet Secretary might seek to consider in the future is the Glasgow Housing Association, for example, ensure sprinkler systems in all communal areas such as bin shelters to reduce risk of, of fire spreading, whether escape routes in high-rise flats and communal areas and bin shelters might be a sensible way forward in the future. Is that something the Ministerial Working Group might look at going forward? Cabinet Secretary. President officer, the Scottish Government very much welcomes the parliamentary scrutiny uh, and indeed the further inquiries uh, by the, the, the relevant uh, committee. So in terms of the, the issues raised, we have an open door uh, to have those uh, discussions. It's important uh, to remember that in terms of uh, sprinklers uh, and, and high-rise uh, flats, that all new high-rise domestic buildings in Scotland uh, are fitted with non-combustible cladding uh, or a cladding system that meets stringent fire tests and since 2005 uh, are fitted uh, with sprinklers. 
the provision of sprinklers within existing high-rise domestic buildings is not compulsory under building regulations at present. However, a number of councils I know do provide these uh, when undertaking major uh, refurbishing work. Uh, we will want to look at a range uh, of fire safety uh, methods, um, including uh, the, the ones that are more automatic in nature, uh, such as uh, sprinklers. And some of the issues that Mr Doris and indeed Mr Stewart in his original uh, question in terms of how we take uh, an evidence-led approach, uh, but also uh, look at those categories um, and those areas uh, and th those building types and uh, individuals who would be uh, at higher risk. And we know that the issues that Mr Stewart <coughs> raised uh, in and around uh, deprivation uh, are indeed pertinent. And I suppose what I would say uh, in conclusion, presiding officer, is that some of these issues uh, will go further uh, afield than building standards. So in terms of looking at groups that are particularly vulnerable to the risk of fire, that's not something that could necessarily may be addressed in building standards. But we have to remember that when we uh, build homes, we don't always necessarily know who will occupy uh, those homes. So some of our uh, consideration has to go further afield uh, than building standards. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her earlier update? Um, and she's entirely right, of course, to focus on high-rise uh, properties, but we've had quite an extensive programme of cladding in Scotland. It doesn't only include high-rise properties. Um, there are, for example, terrace properties uh, which have been done as well. Uh, and there could be a fear there that if there was a fire, fire could spread out and not just up. So could I ask if the working group would be uh, looking at um, terrace properties as well as high-rise? Cabinet Secretary. It's important to stress to Mr Simpson and others that when we talk about aluminium composite material, uh, which should not be in cladding systems in high-rise buildings, that this is um, a generic type of material um, as opposed to a specific product. It's a, a catch-all phrase for a group of specific uh, products. And in some cases, uh, aluminium composite material uh, can be appropriately used in some buildings if it's installed correctly uh, with uh, adherence to the correct uh, procedures. Uh, but as I've already um, indicated to Parliament, um, after our absolute focus on high-rise domestic buildings, that we are widening out our inquiries uh, in terms of schools, uh, NHS buildings, uh, and I'm quite sure that when the Ministerial Working Group uh, meets today uh, to devise our longer-term uh, work programme, which we'll share with Parliament, that we'll be given all consideration to what other uh, types of buildings we need to consider, and we'll keep the Member in Parliament duly informed. And Polly McNeill. Thank you. Um, given the Cabinet Secretary said that at some point there will be widening out the scope of looking at health and safety in high rise, I wonder if she would further consider um, the health and safety regulations as they affect smoke detectors. A recent uh, press report um, states the current regulations say that there's no requirement to determine whether smoke detectors are in working order, for example, a battery powered detector containing discharged or no batteries because the minimum Scottish housing quality standard requirement is the presence of a smoke detector, but not necessarily a working smoke detector. I wonder if she could interrogate that a bit further from today uh, and uh, advise Parliament whether that's something that needs looked at in the wider review. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we will indeed uh, be looking at some of the specifics uh, around the issue that Ms McNeil uh, raises. Um, while there are uh, minimum standards that apply across the board, um, it is fair to say that there are uh, different types of standards uh, for different uh, sectors. Um, and the reason for that is due to uh, history. Um, you know, historically, we've uh, recognised uh, that some of the biggest risk is around the private rented sector. Um, but we are already due uh, this year to issue a consultation about how we could have uh, more uniform standardised uh, procedures. And one of the issues that we discussed at last week at the first uh, meeting of the Ministerial Working Group was how we could expedite that work. Thank you very much. Question number two, 
Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made with the devolution of powers to communities and whether it allows plans to allow communities to have a greater say regarding the impact of major infrastructure projects? Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Community Empowerment Act devolved real power to communities, and this is a theme that runs through all our major reforms. Uh, we'll introduce a local democracy bill later in this parliament uh, that has the potential to be the biggest transformation of democracy since devolution. And our review of the planning system contains proposals which strengthen the role of communities in the planning of their areas. Richard Lockett. Uh, I welcome the Minister's comments and he will be aware there's a growing appetite throughout Scotland for people to have more of a say in the decisions that affect uh, their lives. In terms of the impact of major infrastructure projects, I had a case last week where the, the green light was given to an overhead line relating to Dornell Wind Farm. I know energy is a different portfolio uh, and parts of that should perhaps have been considered for undergrounding at the request of local constituents in Dufton and elsewhere. And I wonder if the planning minister, in terms of the community empowerment agenda, would be able to liaise with the energy minister to ensure there's greater weight given to local views, because we do have a situation in Murray, because we have the Black Hillock substation in Murray, the potential for many more pylons to be built in future years, like a web across Murray, and people want to have more of a say over the shape of those pylons and infrastructure projects. And I'd hope that he would be willing to to liaise with other ministers about how we can give communities a greater say over such projects. Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, I'm always willing to, to speak to colleagues about matters. I'll avoid uh, talking about uh, a particular scheme, because uh, I don't know if it's a live application or not. But as Minister uh, for Planning, uh, I'm pursuing measures to strengthen communities' roles and to increase people's opportunities to influence the future of planning of their areas. Uh, and of course, uh, community consultation on, on major electricity and wind farm uh, projects is of great importance. And when applications for this kind of uh, uh, infrastructure are received by Scottish ministers, we expect developers to demonstrate active community engagement uh, and explain what concerns they have addressed. Uh, we also require that applications are advertised uh, and the public are able to scrutinise and comment on the detail of the proposals. The views of local communities are very important to us and must always be taken into account. Thank you very much. Question number three, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to raise awareness among young carers of welfare support that they may be entitled to. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are an estimated 7,000 carers aged between 16 and 24, providing 35 or more hours of care each week, and less than 4,000 are currently receiving carers' allowance. So working with Young Scott and carers' organisations to advise young carers about their rights and entitlements to apply for carers' allowance, our Young Carers Benefit Take-Up campaign targeted at 16 to 24-year-olds ran during Carers' Week from the 12th of June. The materials were promoted on the Young Scott website and via social media and continue to encourage young carers to claim the support they are entitled to. Further focused activity will take place in August alongside the Young Carers Festival. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Minister for that response. Um, we know the UK benefit system continues to fail in making sure that all those entitled to support know that they are and how to get, uh, sorry, know that what support is available and how to get to that support. Uh, does the Minister agree that the UK Government should both simplify the system of applying for benefits and have a benefit take-up campaign to ensure people are getting the financial support that they are entitled to? Minister. Thank you. For the Scottish Government, of course, Social Security plays a vital role in tackling poverty and improving lives and making sure that everyone receives the financial support to which they're entitled and can do so easily is one of the first steps towards putting dignity and respect at the heart of that service. Unfortunately, the UK Government have taken no recent action to improve take-up and provide this much-needed support. The Fairer Scotland budget is providing £3.6 million of funding in 2016-17 for projects designed to maximise incomes and help people access benefits. In addition, over the course of this parliamentary term, we're delivering a programme of activity to increase benefit uptake, 
working in partnership with local organisations, including local authorities, NHS and third sector organisations. And I'm pleased to say, following Mr Rowley raising this in the Chamber some time ago in my meeting with him yesterday, we will now convene a round table to work constructively with all those agencies uh, and I hope with parties across this Chamber to take this work forward. Question number four, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the impact in Scotland of the UK Government's policy on refugees and asylum seekers. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I met the then Immigration Minister Robert Goodwill MP on 11th of October 2016 and discussed a number of issues affecting refugees and asylum seekers in Scotland. Officials also have regular meetings covering a wide range of issues. I also wrote to the new Immigration Minister, Brandon Lewis, MP, on the 16th of June 2017 about the same issues, highlighting the new Scots refugee integration strategy and making clear my view that destitution should never be an outcome of the asylum system. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Can I ask, with vulnerable people, particularly children, being badly let down by the UK government's broken asylum system and with their human rights ignored, and with the, 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 the local authorities, uh, charities in the third sector being left to pay for the services, how does the Scottish Government's approach to refugees and asylum seekers, particularly through the new Scots strategy, contrast to that of the UK Government? Cabinet Secretary. Side note, the Scottish Government takes a, a very different approach to refugees and asylum seekers. We want to make Scotland a welcoming place to people seeking protection from persecution and human rights abuses. We believe that integration begins from day one of arrival, not just when refugee status has been granted. The very fact that we have the new Scots refugee integration strategy stands in stark contrast to the UK government, which still does not have a strategy. Uh, integration from day one is the key principle of new Scots, and we believe it is vital to build on strong communities and enabling people to settle in and make social connections and build new lives. I am deeply concerned by the UK government's attempts to create, in particular, a two-tier approach to refugees and asylum seekers between those who have arrived for resettlement and those who have arrived through the asylum system. And I have recently, as I said, uh, written to the new UK immigration minister on a variety of matters in relation to this. The Scottish government firmly believes in one system for all asylum seekers and refugees, which treats people fairly, humanely and with respect, no matter how uh, they arrived in Scotland. Otherwise, we risk increasing inequalities and creating barriers to the integration that we all seek. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that every bit as much as being a place of sanctuary, tackling the root causes of migration is essential? And these include, but are not limited to conflict, disease and instability. And in this context, does the Cabinet Secretary welcome, as I do, the recent announcement that the UK Government has committed to a new £75 million fund in this area targeted at reducing the number of people risking the perilous central Mediterranean route to Europe. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it's a pity that the UK government didn't take the opportunity uh, in the, the Queen's speech or indeed with the formation um, of the new uh, central government uh, to think again uh, about the, the, the Dubs Amendment. Uh, they have, Amber Rudd has deliberately closed down a safe and legal route to some of the most vulnerable children in the world. Uh, we know uh, that according to Interpol that 10,000 uh, unaccompanied children in the past two years uh, have went missing uh, across Europe. Uh, nobody knows uh, where they are. Uh, and it is, uh, while there will be aspects of what was announced by the UK government in terms of supporting people um, out with their shores in terms of tackling inequality uh, and uh, ill health uh, and any investment overseas uh, in terms of international development or uh, addressing the causes uh, of conflict, of course, uh, should be welcomed. But we have a long way to go before we have a humane approach to immigration, asylum and migration uh, across the UK government. And it's very sad uh, that the UK government is not standing up to meet all its obligations, and particular its obligations uh, to our most vulnerable global citizens, and that has to be children. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to help promote women to more senior positions in public and private sector. Cabinet Secretary. 
presiding officer, the Scottish Government is committed to improving the representation of women uh, in senior positions in the public and private sector, uh, and indeed here in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, this is the right thing to do, and it's actually the smart thing to do. On the 15th of June, we introduced the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill, which sets an objective for public boards to have 50% uh, of non-executive members who are women. In relation to the private sector, uh, we will continue to encourage companies uh, to work towards gender balance through our 50-50 by 2020 campaign and to adopt fair and progressive business practices more broadly through the Scottish Business Pledge. Brian Whittle. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, this SNP government has cut 152,000 college, college places with Audit Scotland finding that this has disproportionately affected women. Does the Minister believe that this will help to tackle gender inequality in the workplace? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if Mr Whittle had to look at the facts, he would find that the majority of college students are actually women, uh, and women are far from uh, underrepresented uh, in colleges. And given, given that it's not that long ago that youth unemployment was at 113,000, it was quite right uh, at that time for our college sector, along with other partners to focus uh, on young people who were leaving school and we have seen demonstrable progress in that area now that youth unemployment uh, is amongst the uh, lowest uh, in Europe uh, and that school leaver destinations are at a record high. Um, of course, the Audit Scotland uh, report on colleges will give much food for thought uh, to education uh, ministers, particularly uh, as we have manifesto commitments and work uh, that Mr Hepburn has been progressing around returner programmes for women, the work that Mr Hepburn is leading around maternity uh, and pregnancy uh, discrimination. So I think in terms of the actions uh, that we have taken as a government uh, to promote fair work, whether that's for women uh, or indeed young people, that we've got a record to be proud of. Question number six, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to increase the availability of social housing in rural communities. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government understands how important good quality housing is for the uh, future of Scotland's prosperity and for the strength and diversity of our communities. And that is why over the lifetime of this Parliament, uh, we're investing over three billion pounds to deliver our bold and ambitious target of at least 50,000 affordable homes in both rural and urban communities across Scotland. 35,000 of these homes will be for social rent, representing an increase of 75% on our previous social rented target, which of course we exceeded. Through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme, we have various housing initiatives designed to increase the number of affordable homes for rent or purchase, which will benefit rural Scotland. For social rented homes in particular, our enhanced grant subsidy benchmarks for rural areas were increased in 2016 by up to £14,000 per unit. In addition to this, the Flexible Grant and Loan Housing Infrastructure Fund was introduced last year to unblock strategically important housing sites. We also recently committed to long-term resource planning assumptions amounting to £1.754 billion to March 2021, which will provide councils across Scotland the certainty needed to ramp up plans to deliver our ambitious 50,000 target. And of course, the Housing Scotland Act 2014 ended the right to buy for all social housing tenants in Scotland on the 1st of August last year protecting the existing stock of social rented homes and preventing the sale of up to 15,500 houses over the next decade. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Minister for that response. Organisations such as the Rural Stirling Housing Association in my own region play an important role in ensuring a diverse range of housing for rural communities. The Minister mentioned additional investment. Any additional resources for social housing is of course welcome, although we would go further by building over 100,000 houses for all sectors over the course of this Parliament. However, additional resources will only be part of the solution. We also need a more efficient planning system in Scotland. Currently, the timescale for planning approvals is longer than elsewhere in the UK. So can I ask the Minister, does he agree that social housing in rural Scotland would benefit from a more efficient planning process in Scotland? Minister. I had the great pleasure last year of visiting Rural Stirling Housing Association's uh, development in Strathblane. 
uh, which was the first new social housing in that village between in between 40 or 50 years, the villagers themselves couldn't quite decide. Uh, it was very welcome indeed, uh, and also provided um, a wheelchair accessible home, uh, which was much needed in that area. Uh, and I am determined to ensure that uh, housing associations like Rural Stirling can continue that job to build in places that have not had social housing for a very long time. In terms of the planning situation, uh, presiding officer, uh, Mr Lockhart will be very well aware uh, of the steps that the government has taken since the independent planning review crossed my desk at the very beginning of this parliamentary term. We have had uh, huge amounts of stakeholder uh, consultation uh, which will result uh, in a new planning bill which will be introduced into this parliament uh, by the end of the year. Uh, I anticipate uh, that that planning bill will lead to uh, much uh, easier uh, planning systems for all, uh, which hopefully will re lead to swifter decisions in many places. However, uh, presiding officer, I should also point out that a lot of this is down to elected members and local authorities, and that is why we're also providing training to ensure that they get planning absolutely right. Thank you very much. We're not making a lot of progress here, but if we could have shorter questions and shorter answers. Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, in terms of the 35,000 social rented housing, can the minister say exactly how much housing is going to be built in each local authority area? What funding has been allocated per year to each local authority area? What is the local authorities expected <coughs> then to contribute to actually make that happen? In terms of planning, what land is available? Uh, what planning permission has been sought? What planning permission has been granted? There just seems to be a lack of detailed information in terms of where these 35,000 houses are going to be built, how they're going to be built. Um, Presiding yes, officer, you asked for short answers, <laughs> no, and I'm afraid conscious. that would be uh, absolutely impossible under, uh, under that circumstance. Um, Presiding officer, uh, as Mr. Uh, Rowley is well aware, um, the uh, local authorities themselves have provided uh, the government with uh, their strategic housing investment plans, which outline uh, some of the schemes that they are bringing forward. Uh, Ab above that, you know, we, as I said earlier to uh, Mr Lockhart, have given the resource planning assumptions to all local authorities just the other week. That's the £1.754 billion. Um, each local authority knows what its resource planning assumption is for each of the next three years, as was asked uh, of the government. That gives them certainty uh, in planning. Uh, in terms of land, Mr Rowley will be very well aware that I've written to local authorities to get them to look even more at the use of compulsory purchase orders. Uh, the government in its manifesto said that we would bring forward legislation during the course of this parliament to look at compulsory sale orders as well uh, to try and, and free up the land. I have probably missed uh, some of uh, the, 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 the bits that Mr Rowley has asked me there. Uh, I'm more than willing, as always, uh, to meet Mr Rowley and others to go into more depth about how we are going to achieve our ambitious target. Question number seven, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that local authorities and the house building sector can be confident that the goal of 50,000 new affordable homes by 2021 is reached. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. We are taking action to ensure that communities across Scotland have homes that are high quality, efficient and affordable to reach our goal of 50,000 affordable homes by 2021. Uh, for the first time, details have been confirmed of each local authority's full funding allocation for affordable housing over the next three years. As a result, uh, more than 1.754 billion uh, is being allocated to councils. Uh, for Mr Crawford's own council area, Stirling, that means an allocation of 26.59 million. Uh, this is a major Scottish Government commitment, not only to deliver more affordable housing, but also an important signal to the house building sector in Scotland, which demonstrates our commitment to the industry and the estimated 14,000 jobs our affordable housing supply programme supports each year. Bruce Crawford. Well, I thank the Minister very much for his answer. And it's de I'm delighted, obviously, that Stirling constituency, my constituency of Stirling, will see so much money delivered for it. I know that Dean Lockhart will want to put a press release out to the Stirling Observer welcoming this news very shortly. 
But, ca but can I ask that the government what it is going to do to ensure that smaller construction companies get their fair share of the market and help to build the affordable homes that we need in Scotland? Minister. <laughs> President officer, I'm quite happy for all members in the chamber to put out welcome and press releases uh, about uh, the government's commitment over uh, the next three years. Uh, but Mr um, Crawford makes a specific point, a very important one. Uh, local authorities and housing associations tender for individual projects in an open and transparent way, uh, which ensures value for money. But could also and should also enable small and medium-sized enterprises to bid for work. Some local authorities, such as Angus, have an approach uh, around breaking down scale of their procurement in a way that enables uh, small SMEs to bid for that work and to build their capacity. I would hope that all local authorities uh, give careful consideration and thought through their pr procurement policy. Uh, we're also working with councils and housing associations to encourage the use of lots within larger contracts and to always consider the impact on SMEs when developing frameworks. Support for SMEs is also available free of charge from the Scottish Government funded supplier development programme, which offers expert training, support and information to help SMEs win work and grow their businesses. President officer, the, the most important thing I think for me is going around the country and seeing the amount of uh, apprentices that are working for SMEs. Apprentices who are the future of our construction industry uh, and I think uh, long may that continue and any support that local authorities and housing associations can give to SMEs is welcome as far as I'm concerned. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In the Scottish Government press release dated 13th June 2017, the Minister announced that the Scottish Government, and I quote, has a goal of 50,000 new affordable homes by 2021. Can the Minister confirm that the 50,000 affordable homes will in fact all be newly built properties, that's to say additional to the physical stock that existed at the beginning of this Parliament? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as Mr uh, uh, Whiteman is, is well aware, um, I would also allow uh, some flexibilities uh, from councils where they want to buy back stock and bring that back into uh, the uh, social housing sector. I think it's very important that that flexibility is there. Our plan is to deliver 50,000 affordable homes during the course of this parliament, 35,000 for social rent. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, presiding officer. There are around 34,000 empty homes across Scotland. Uh, does the Scottish Government share the Scottish Conservatives' ambition to use new, new initiatives and stronger regulation to bring such properties back into use and provide more affordable housing? Minister. Uh, President Officer, uh, Mr Stewart may be aware that the number of empty homes is shrinking in Scotland and we have a number of initiatives including the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership, uh, which continues on uh, in this financial year. Um, it's also important to note the work of dedicated empty homes officers uh, that some lo local authorities have put in place. And I would encourage others uh, to do likewise. Some of those uh, empty homes officers um, are in partnership in some places with Shelter Scotland. Uh, their help is welcome in that regard. I am more than willing, presiding officer, uh, to meet with Mr Stewart to hear about the Scottish Conservatives programme uh, proposals. Um, I, I am uh, not, uh, not known for not being unwilling to nick good ideas if they are good ideas. So if Mr Stewart wants to uh, come and meet with me to discuss his proposals further, I'm more than happy to meet with him. Question eight, Mary Evans. Thank you, presiding officer. I would remind the chamber that I'm the PLO to the cabinet secretary. Uh, I would ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure the safe and timely delivery of the first payments to be made under Scotland's new social security system. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The safe and secure transfer of the 11 benefits for the 1.4 million people who rely on them is, of course, our main priority. Uh, last week, we introduced the Social Security Scotland Bill to this Parliament, and it represents the next significant milestone, putting the necessary legislative framework in place to allow the delivery of payments under the new social security system. We've learned lessons from other programmes of change, not least the UK government's flawed and yet to be completed introduction of universal credit. And we know that a phased approach, transferring the benefits incrementally, is the best way to ensure their safe and timely delivery. 
We are committed to ensuring that individuals with lived experience of the benefit system help shape our approach. And on 30th of May, the Cabinet Secretary set out our plans for the first wave of benefits, carers allowance supplement from summer 2018 and best start grant and funeral expense assistance by summer 2019. Mary Evans. I thank the Minister for that response. Um, can the Minister also provide an update on the work currently being undertaken on establishing a social security agency for Scotland and if the announcement on the location of this is still expected in the autumn? Minister Jean Freeman. I thank the member for that supplementary question. The work is progressing through what we have set up as an agency project board with local partners uh, and uh, local trade unions to identify not only uh, the agency's uh, content in terms of jobs and begin to specify some of that, some of that but to also identify co-location opportunities and uh, working conditions for those who will be employed in the agency. I will make an announcement on the location of the agency's centralised function in the autumn and provide an update on our progress in delivering a central and, I believe, very important feature of our Scottish approach, which is locally based Social Security Agency staff. Thank you. Question number nine, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the impact on Scotland of the equalities and social security aspects of the proposals in the Queen's speech. Cabinet Secretary. Deciding officer, the Queen's speech was yet another wasted opportunity from the UK government to make, social, uh, to make society more equal and fairer for millions of people across the UK. It is of course deeply disappointing but in no way surprising that the Queen's speech did not signal any reduction in the Tories' continued austerity plans or any reversal of its deeply damaging social security cuts such as the £29 cut to employment support allowance for unemployed disabled people the cap on child tax credit or the repugnant rape clause eh, or indeed the benefit cap which last week the High Court in England eh, called illegal and discriminatory against single parents and children and a policy that the judge damned as real misery being caused to no good purpose. Colin Beattie. What we learned from last week's Queen's speech was that, if, if I can quote Theresa May here, nothing has changed. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she thinks it's right that the Tories' obsession with austerity and cuts will continue despite the volume of evidence against it and their failed general election gamble? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, to answer the, the member's question directly, no, I don't think it's right, but uh, the UK government is not interested uh, in doing what is right or indeed what the evidence shows or in helping those who, I quote, uh, are just about managing. Uh, disabled people, women and minority ethnic people have been particularly adversely affected by the austerity agenda. Uh, in stark contrast, we've just published a social security bill which is based on the principles uh, of dignity, fairness and respect. Question 10 has not been lodged. Question 11, Richard Lyell. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when, uh, when the Cabinet Secretary for Community, Social Security and Equalities last met North Lancashire Council and what was discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Side officer, ministers and officials regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including North Lanarkshire Council, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government and Housing, most recently met with the Chief Executive of the Council on the 13th of June. Richard Lyle. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware of the recent Hollytown Link Road proposed to be built in my constituency. These works are the result of the city deal. Many residents have raised their concerns about the Hollytown Link Road. Despite this, North Lancashire Council has announced that the city deal cabinet has approved the project. Can I therefore ask the cabinet secretary if she believes that the city deal cabinet should have listened to the voices of the local people and politicians and delivered for communities when no one wants this road? Cabinet secretary. Um, I think perhaps the best thing for me to do, President Officer, would be to speak to the Economy Secretary and the uh, Transport Minister, um, who will be more appraised of the details with regards to the specific road uh, that Mr uh, Lyle uh, refers to. Uh, of course, we would always uh, encourage local authorities to be acutely listening uh, to uh, their local communities uh, and to, as far as possible, uh, represent uh, the views of the community. Uh, but I'm conscious that they uh, have the, the interests 
uh, of the wider uh, North Lanarkshire community to represent uh, also. But I will get uh, either uh, and or either the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and the Transport Minister to respond uh, to Mr Lyle. Thank you very much. And that concludes portfolio questions. Apologies to members, a number of members who didn't get a chance to